Good morning. Welcome once again to Cornerstone Live. So glad you've taken the opportunity to join with us today as we open God's Word. I want to tell you a story. It was 1970. 1969, December, had not been a very good year for me. I had developed appendicitis, which uh, turned into a burst appendix and peritonitis, which meant that there was poison going all through my body. I spent nearly three weeks in the hospital, maybe maybe it was even over four weeks, and three weeks in the hospital before I came home. Eventually, I would have the opportunity to go back to school a number of weeks later. As I thought about going back to school, I really wasn't that anxious to do it for a number of reasons. One, I had a long tube that was installed into my abdomen. It was installed, and then every day that bandages had to be changed, trying to draw the poison out of my abdomen to the outside of my body so that uh, I wouldn't suffer you know, a systemic failure in my body due to the infection that I had accumulated as having part of having the burst appendix. The second reason why I wasn't anxious to go back to school is because I was the object of bullying. My father in the 1960s and, er and beyond that was a policeman. And not a good time in American history to be a policeman, sometimes like it is now. But uh, not only was he a policeman, but he was the juvenile officer, which meant he was the one that dealt with kids, kids that were in trouble, which meant that my peers in seventh grade, some of their brothers, even some of them, and some of their moms and dads had been the object of being interacting with my father, maybe even being arrested by them. As a result of that, uh, not only was I subject to verbal abuse constantly, every day, uh, but occasionally was subject to physical abuse. And that's where the bullies would get you, sometimes two of them, three of them would get you in a corner, and they would just beat the daylights out of you. It happened a number of times to me. So I was concerned about that. Of course, my stomach was tender. Uh, I was extremely weak, so weak that when uh, I got back to school and had gone to my biology class, they opened up, I don't know, an aluminum, uh, uh, an alcohol packet rather, and the smell of that associated, I guess, PTSD back to the hospital, I passed out on the floor. Not long after that, I was walking through the hallway and my locker was kind of in a back hall. And as I was walking through, uh, one of those bullies grabbed me. Uh, he, he was kind of the leader of the bully ring. Uh, he had had trouble with an older brother who had been arrested. I can't remember if it was for burglary or something. But anyway, it was something that his, his brother got sent to the juvenile, used to be called Juvenile Hall. But it wasn't a nice place to be for doing something he shouldn't have done. Anyway, he got a hold of me. And... Uh, pushed me against the locker, and began to pound on me like he did on other occasions, literally since I had been in probably first or second grade. So he'd followed me through uh, school. I think he was actually one grade higher than I was. But almost immediately, four large what I assume were high schoolers, because I was in seventh grade, came up and they grabbed him off of me. They pulled him back into a corner of the hallway that went outside. We always said it was a smoking door because people went out behind the building to smoke. And they began to pounce on him. And as they did, they were telling him to never come around me again, to leave me alone. I, I was stunned. I was just, I guess, the... The, the, the locker, they were over in a corner. They never said a word to me. And then he ran off, and then they just turned and left. And I just stood there, stunned. I never could identify who they were. And all of my years in junior high and high school, I looked for those faces. I never could find them. My brother and sister who were older from me didn't know them. Where did they come from? I'm convinced that as a 12-year-old, I had an encounter with the spiritual world. That those weren't just kids, not high schoolers. 
but they were emissaries, ministering spirits sent by God to bring protection to my life and maybe to help me to understand that there was a world beyond what I could see. We're talking about kindness and rebooting our lives with kindness and what that does to bring change to the world around us and how that brings change to us as well. But there is another aspect to kindness that is sometimes overlooked, and that is our acts of kindness sometimes allow the veil between the spiritual and the physical world to be rolled back in a way that gives us a glimpse into things that we would never see. Look what it says here in our passage this morning found in Hebrews 13, 1 to 3. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For in so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Well, we know that that kindness is an antidote to hate. But some of us didn't know that kindness, hospitality as it were, which certainly is an extension of kindness, is, is a vehicle that pulls back the curtain between the seen and the unseen world, the spiritual and the physical world. Keep on loving your brothers and sisters, and don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, because some people have inadvertently entertained angels. We see that story played out in the scripture first, in the story of Abraham. Abraham, uh, it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, uh, while he was sitting at the entrance of, the, of his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Uh, when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent. He was relaxing there, by the way, to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Now remember, there's three of these visitors. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under the tree. Let me give you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. What we understand about the story is Abraham did not know in the beginning that these three visitors who looked like men traveling in the heat of the day, which was unusual, of course, because Abraham's resting. He's in this arid climate. He's resting, but as he sees them, he offers them hospitality. Come into my tent. Come into the shade. Let's get you washed and cleaned up. Let's relax. Let's get you some food. Thanks for coming. But he doesn't know at that moment, he will pretty shortly in this story, that they are emissaries of the Lord God. He knows that later on because the first thing is they tell him, well, we're going to come back in a year. And when we do, your 90-year-old wife, I guess she maybe she was 89 then, is going to have a baby. <laughs> of course, we know that his wife laughs, and therefore, you know, her kid gets the name, he laughs. Uh, yeah, Isaac. We also know from the story that once Abraham comes to realize that these are not ordinary visitors, he begins the negotiation about the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which have gone, you know, really hog wild with sin, and his is the place where his nephew lives. So those cities are under threat of being destroyed for their sin, and Abraham begins the negotiation that's famous in the scripture. You know, can we find 50, 45, you know, all the way down? Can we just find a handful of people, which they can't find? Angels then begin to appear, at least the understanding of their appearing, <coughs> throughout the scripture. But it all starts in this particular point in time. But something else happens parallel to that. And that is occasionally the term is used, uh, not only like it's used here, these visitors used here, 
but the term is used of human messengers. There are a number of occasions where that happens. It happens, first of all, well, I should say first of all, but it happens uh, in one spot where John sends messengers to Jesus to find out if he's the Messiah. And they are called ain't the same word for angels. Jezebel, <laughs> not the best character in the scripture, sends a messenger, the queen's messenger, to uh, Elijah, uh, basically saying, you know, I'm going to take your life tomorrow. Um, Haggai, who is a prophet, is said to be the Lord's angel, the Lord's messenger. And then there's the story of the seven angels in the scripture, the seven angels which appear in Revelation. And some scholars, as they read this passage, and remember it's apocryphal, so trying to get the complete right understanding is a mystery to start with, but these seven angels are actually the seven lead pastors uh, of those seven churches, and because the documents are written to a church, not necessarily even to a group of churches, but to a church. So here you have the idea of messengers of God not only being spiritual beings, angels, you know, from uh, God's dimension, but we have messengers of God being people. But here's the interesting thing. It's meant to be deliberately vague in the scripture. So therefore, when we're expressing kindness to someone, how do we know whether they're just, you know, your neighbor who's always your neighbor, or whether this is some taking on of human form by a spiritual being to bring some ministry to God's people. Well, one of the things we see in these passages is that the ministry of angels and the ministry that God has given his people, his church, as ministers of, the rec of reconciliation to the world is very similar. And maybe it's similar for one of the purposes that we can never know exactly which dimension we are dealing with? Is this the dimension behind the curtain? Or is this the dimension in front of us that's the physical world? It is deliberately vague for a reason. Well, maybe because if you knew, it would cause you to act differently. And here you don't know. So here's the opportunity to sometimes see the spiritual curtain, that place in, that we do not see opened up for us to see in a way that we would never experience. And sometimes it's God using people to be his ministry to us. Let's look a little further at this as we look at the idea of the ministry of angels. Again, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for in so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So here we understand hospitality in the same way we understand kindness. Now remember what kindness is. Let me give you that definition again. Kindness is marked by acts of behavior, acts of generosity, consideration and concern for others without expecting praise or reward. And we, we looked at Aristotle's definition, which fits the scripture here. Helpfulness towards someone in need, not to get anything in return, nor for the benefit of the person giving it. So hospitality is the same way. But here, as we look in this particular passage in Hebrews 13, it, it, uh, it even takes that idea of not getting something in return to a higher level by saying this. This is hospitality to strangers, which could be the displaced. It could be the passerby. It could be the immigrant. It could be the homeless. It is someone who doesn't have any familiarity with us, not your neighbor. It's not this, I mean, it could be your neighbor, but I'm saying it wants to expand this to those who have no connection with you. It is prisoners. Now, what we have to understand in Hebrews, the people were put into prison if they owed money. There wasn't a such thing as bankruptcy. If you owed people money and you didn't pay, they put you in prison. And they could put you in prison if they didn't like you 
or if they didn't like something you said. And of course, Christians were put into prison. So prisoners were in prison for lots of, I, lots of reasons that had nothing to do with crime. So here we have people who were in prison. We have those who are mistreated, those who are suffering, some emotionally, some physically, some relationally. But overall, what you see and hear about this act of generosity, of hospitality, of kindness, is none of these people can pay anything back, right? You can't get anything in return for it. That's what we looked at in the week past. Sometimes our acts of kindness in this world, where there is nothing for us to in return, gives us interaction with the spiritual world, with beings, spiritual beings, who normally wouldn't have physical form, or they take on human form, and they interact with the population. But we don't always know, and may never know, perhaps work to work with Jesus and the Father in heaven, who these were. And maybe we'll never know. Maybe that's also part of it. But we have this opportunity to act with these angels, Sometimes these angels are spiritual beings, but also the scripture tells us sometimes these angels are not spiritual beings. They are people who become ministering spirits, as it were, from God as well. Let's look a little further on that. So what is this mission of angels that also is common to our mission? Let's look at the first thing. Angels are on a mission. It says in Hebrews 1.14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Service to others. Has anybody ever sat down and been a minister to you who was not a minister? Uh, I always am amazed at my wife and her capacity to minister to people, particularly to strangers. She has this amazing capacity to go to people she doesn't know. She could sit in the park. She could sit on a bench in the, in the local mall. She could be in the grocery line. And literally within a number of minutes, she knows somebody's name. She knows their spouse's name or if they've lost their spouse. She knows their dog's name. She knows their grandkid's name because there is something about her when she is in the presence of people that they open up to her. They open up and share their lives. And when they do, they receive something back as the Holy Spirit speaks through her life and ministers to them. Sometimes there are these spiritual beings that come and do this ministry to us. It's unexpected. Sometimes that ministry comes through other people where someone sat down with you or maybe even just saw you in the checkout line and ministered to you. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Angels are protective. Psalm 91, 11 through 12 says, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, that they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You'll remember that verse also was quoted um, to Jesus in the wilderness as a temptation verse. But here's the truth of the matter. Angels do interact protectively with us. This past summer, we uh, were trying to go to our daughters uh, for the day, one of the few places we could go because we had bubbled together and uh, started out. And then we were delayed for a few seconds, uh, got on the road and headed down the road. And you might remember the story. Someone pulled in front of us and we hit them. Um, they were in our lane. It ended up being their fault, but here's the issue. Had it been a few seconds later or a few seconds sooner, it's very likely I was in a truck, they were in a small car. We would have killed the elderly person in the car. Where was the angel at in this? There was some delay, some pushing to get us a little bit faster, a little bit slower, uh, and there was a protective quality to that. Maybe you've sensed that when you didn't take a road and something occurred there, or uh, maybe something happened in your life in particular that you knew that there was a protective force involved with that. Uh, we have seen that 
and our lives in numerous ways. Uh, we had a situation a number of years ago. We were on our way again to see our daughter. Mm, maybe there's something to this. On Interstate 70, uh, Turnpike 76, going towards Geneva. And the traffic was heavy there. Uh, in that moment, a car that was only a couple of lengths in front of us hit the back end of a tractor trailer, hit the trailer on the tire. The car flipped end over end over end over end over end um, in the middle of the road. All the cars scattered. There were trucks behind us. You know how people got stopped. You just don't know. But the car began to catch on fire. People jumped out. I jumped out. And we began trying to get the person out of the car. And the door was, you know, jammed in there. Uh, ultimately, that person was able to be pulled out of the car. And then we all just went on our, well, traffic, you know, they, they were, the wrecker came and the police came. They asked a few questions and we left. I never saw any of them again. But there was something in that moment that was protective for that person, wasn't there? There was some ministry actually occurring to them. So we know that angels have a protective feature. And sometimes we are unable to be in that protective feature, to be at the right place, as it were and the right time. Another ministry of angels is angels bring life-changing announcements. This is in Luke 1, but we could have looked at the other announcement in uh, the story of uh, Mary being told by the angel. Let's go down to the 11th verse there. This is about Zechariah, and uh, he sees an angel, and it says, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled. Hey, no kidding, huh? was gripped with fear, but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're to call him John. Here, Zechariah prays, but he never expects God to answer him. Have you ever been like that? You've prayed, and you're praying, and you're praying, and then when the answer finally comes, you're like, Huh? What? Is that, is that for me? Uh, here you have this spiritual being meeting Zachariah. He's in the temple, so nobody else is supposed to be in there. So Zachariah knows this guy doesn't belong there. What he looks like, we don't know. But he gives this announcement that your prayer's been answered and something amazing is going to happen in your life. Uh, how are people <laughs> those bearers of announcements? You know, I think anytime we have the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, that it's the answer to what they've been looking for we can become ministering uh, God's messengers to them. Angels means messenger uh, by sharing the story of how the gospel came to us. And sometimes maybe an angel will appear and say, hey, you know what? Just let you know your prayer is going to be answered. Some of you have stories like that that you know and it's been part of your life. So let's look a little bit further at uh this ministry of angels. Angels give directions. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip in Acts 1 20, or 8 26, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down to Jerusalem from Gaza. So he started out on his way to meet an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Kandaki. I think that's what it says, which means queen of, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Hey, let's give it to Philip here. Philip is the first man who stopped and asked for directions. Let's all be like Philip men. Instead of, you know, recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. So here the angel tells Philip, you need to be in this place at this moment. Because at this moment, at this intersection, somebody's going to come through you need to meet. You need to be in that place in time. Did you ever ask it as somebody for direction? A number of years ago, uh, this was a, a long time ago, I had to go on a hospital visit over to Oakland. And the number of, in our city, a number of the streets were closed. And outside of Oakland, there is a part of the city at that particular time was an extremely dangerous part of this. A lot of crime, a lot of drug use. And as I turned from street to street to street, I got lost and put myself right in the middle of what would be considered to be the most crime area, highest crime area of our city. 
And I was scared. I really was. I, 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 and I didn't know which way to go. It seemed like every turn, I got it got worse and worse and worse. I, that on the street was one individual, an elderly man, and I pulled up alongside of him. I didn't. I said, "Sir, I don't want to scare you." He said, "He said, boy, you're lost, aren't you?" <laughs> and this kindly old man said to me, "Young fella." You need to get yourself turned around, go back down that street, and you know it was the right, left, right, and you're going to get back to where you need to be, but you should not be in this neighborhood at this time of night. And I said, thank you, and off I went. So how did that man get there at that moment? Was Or was he a man? I can tell you what, he shot sure about reassurance in my life, and it taught me, ask for directions. <laughs> Well, what else does the scripture tell us here about the ministry of angels? Let's look on. Angels bridge people to the next step of faith. Acts chapter 10, verses 3 through 8. Uh, one day about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he had a vision. This is Cornelius. He distinctly, distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him, stared at him in fear. Wow, everybody's the same way. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor. See, here Cornelius has been kind, hasn't he, to others, have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. It almost sounds like a song, Simon the Tanner by the sea. So here you have uh, a good man, Cornelius, but he is not informed about the gospel, even though he is generous and kind to the people around him. And God has taken notice of that, his, his actions, his kindness to others. And God sends a messenger to him. And that messenger tells him, all right, it's time to take the next step. And to do that, you got to get Peter so he can inform you about Jesus Christ, who's died for your sins and come to be your Savior and Lord. And he does that. He responds to the angel. So here we have angels leading people to the next step in faith. By the way, that's part of all of the ministry of the church, isn't it? It's to help people to find the next point of walking with Jesus Christ, whether it's coming into faith initially or walking with him in a deeper way. We all have that opportunity to do. And I hope someone has done that in your life. In my life, it has been numerous people who have done that. I think about a guy named Gary, who was the custodian at the church where I initially was growing up and where I found Jesus. And I would go and help Gary clean the church. And Gary would listen to me, just listen. And that listening enabled me to take all sorts of next steps of faith. Thanks, Gary, for doing that in my life as a as a teenager. I greatly appreciate that. Angels also have another ministry. They break people out of prison. What a great story this is. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. See, you pray and then God brings an answer. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared in the lone, the, the light shone, shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. So here's an angel like, let's get, get up quick. Uh, or quick, get up. He said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Didn't even need keys here. The angel said, put on your clothes and sandals. So here he's telling them what to do. And, the, and Peter said, uh, Peter did so rather. Wrap your cloak around you. Follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing or what was really happening, he thought he was seeing a vision. I think it means he thought he was having a dream. They passed the first and second gates and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. Isn't this cool? And that I added that, of course. And then went through it. And when they walked the length of one street, a block, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people uh, were hoping would happen. I guess I didn't put that in there, but you get the idea. The angel breaks him out of prison. 
there are stories after stories of people. I, I remember a fellow in our church who found a track in a phone booth, and that track in a phone booth led him on his search for Jesus. Someone else who, when they used to do street witnessing, which I did as a teenager in the city of Pittsburgh, but wasn't involved in this one, somebody witnessed to them about Jesus Christ, and they found Jesus as a result of that. Somebody who, you know, couldn't get their radio. Uh, radios were things they had before they had internet phones, but they couldn't dial the radio to find the right station, found the Christian station, the only station that was playing, and found Jesus Christ. They broke out of prison. Somebody whose drug addiction was broken because somebody had a word for them. So here we have the angel breaking Peter out of prison. What a great story. The chains fell off by themselves. The gates opened by themselves. I love this. This is science fiction kind of stuff, but it's not. It's real stuff. The spiritual world opened, and there was deliverance given. Now, remember, this is after Jesus. So, so the angels had, didn't stop because Jesus came. The angels are still among us and still having this ministry among us. And sometimes people do this when they see help people find deliverance from fear and anxiety, from addictions and from all of the things, that uh, sadness and depression that seem to imprison us in life. Another ministry of angels is angels bring encouragement. I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. This is Paul. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last line, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously, graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as I told, told uh, just as it was told me. Nonetheless, we must run aground on some island. Yeah. So there is like good news here. The good news is the ship is going to crash. It's going to crash into the reef or the rocks or the uh, the shoal of the island. But everybody in the ship is going to be saved. The angel speaks to Paul, and then Paul speaks to them. So everybody on the ship doesn't see the angel. Paul only has this vision or dream or interaction with this being. And he is told, you need to encourage everybody else because the ship is going to crash. But we're still going to all make it. So isn't that an interesting way to put it? These, this angel brings encouragement to Paul and to those whose ship strike is going to strike the reef. You may be God's messenger to somebody through Christian kindness, through expressing the love of Jesus Christ to the stranger, to the prisoner, to the traveler, to the abused, to the beaten down. So live protectively against the powerless, the innocent, the abused, the oppressed, the mistreated, the stranger, the immigrant. Bring life-changing announcements to someone by sharing the, how you came to Jesus Christ and what God's doing in your life now. Offer direction to someone who's searching to find those big answers in life that are all found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Be a bridge to someone who's wondering who needs to take the next step in finding faith. Help someone break out of the prison of loneliness and isolation, particularly in these days that we're living in. Uh, addictions, all of those things where people need the chains to fall off. Bring encouragement to those whose ship is crashed on the reef or is about to, that they're going to be okay. And make your life one of kindness not expecting something in return, but allowing it to be used to touch someone else's life. Because of what happens in our life, sometimes we become the agent of kindness. Sometimes angels are interacting with us, though. Other people are becoming God's messengers to us. You may never know when the curtain is being pulled up so that you can see the unseen world. April 18th, 2010, was the most difficult day of our lives. 
It was that day, late at night, when the knock came on our door, that our son, a missionary pilot training in Florida, was killed in an airplane crash that day. His airplane had gone down. Unless you've experienced that knock on the door, that person coming to you, it's hard to explain what you feel. Shocked, disbelief, crushed. But what also happened to us as we came into the presence of angels? When we got the news on the 18th of April, we were only three days away from a family vacation with our son at Disney World, if you can imagine that. We had planned this trip, and that very day we were supposed to solidify where we were getting our tickets for Disney World. I was to be talking to my son at 6 o'clock that night. We ended up having to take a flight that flight down there on Wednesday, just a couple of days later. When we came into the airport, our despair was all over our faces and our demeanor. It was then that someone took us. A woman came out of a room and she said, you folks look like you need to be by yourself, some time away from the fray of this. And she ushered us into a room that was there for military families who had come to meet the bodies of their loved ones being brought back from from war. It was an extreme act of kindness. She didn't say anything else to us, just brought us in there. A few moments later, she came and said, we're going to get you on the plane first, so you don't have to stand in a line. You know, you're in in a fog, to be honest with you, and the grief is so intense. And they got us on the plane. It was the first of many acts of kindness. When we got into Florida, I wanted to go to the crash site. And so when I went there, I had the opportunity to speak to the airport manager who had, who had been there and witnessed the plane going down. And he brought reassurance to us that as tragic as it was that my son's death was, was instantaneous, there was the police officer that called me on the phone and had been the one at the scene of the accident who was a follower of Jesus Christ and said, I want to let you know we're praying for you. And and how difficult this is, but your son is with Jesus now. He's flown to see him. There were the folks in our church. We were going down for a vacation with our son first, and then to a conference, a week-long conference with the leaders of our church, and how the leaders of our church took care of us in that week, that extra week that we were down there. We were down there for two weeks, and just ministered to us and loved us. They didn't ask for explanations. They didn't ask for information. There were the pastors and pastor spouses who came and hugged us and loved us and prayed with us and cried with us. It was human kindness just being flown, flowing over us from every direction. There were angels in the midst of that. I can't tell you which ones were spiritual beings from behind the veil, and which one were just humans on this side of the veil. But what I do know is they ministered to us as fellow inheritors of the salvation God had brought to us. God wants you to be a minister to other people, to be an angel to them, a messenger of his grace and mercy through kindness. And at times, you're going to be the beneficiary of that. You are going to see angels. You may never know it. But as we express human kindness to others, we have this amazing opportunity to see God's work in a way we never expected. Let me me take the opportunity and pray for you. But as I, just before I do, let's take one look again at that passage Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For in so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for these ministering spirits that you send to us from 
the other side of the veil, the other side of the curtain from the spiritual world that enter into our world and bring ministry to our lives in unexpected ways, in ways we don't even know or, or completely understand. And thank you for the opportunity you give us to minister to other people around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ as messengers of reconciliation to the world around us. What a privilege we have. We are both the recipients and the givers of grace through the mercy that you have given us through forgiveness in Jesus Christ. What a privilege we have. Thank you so much that you care so much about us and give us grace as we reach out in kindness and in hospitality to others around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for joining with us today. Uh, this is a special weekend for us. I'll talk a little bit about more next week. But on Monday, I will have completed 40 years of, actually more than 40 years of ministry with Cornerstone Church. And the church's first service was February 1st, 1981. It was held in uh, uh, our living room. And uh, there were uh, just a handful of people. I'll tell you more about that story next week. But uh, happy birthday, church, uh, for 40, completing 40 years of ministry and service to the Pittsburgh area and to the world around us. Well, I hope you enjoyed being with us today. Take the opportunity to like us on Facebook and YouTube. It's really great when you share the link. Uh, because that helps uh, to get more people involved with not only the message uh, that is today about these ministering spirits, but also introduces them to the other opportunities to come to know Jesus through the ministry of Cornerstone Church. You also have the opportunity to use the Givelify app. Uh, you can get it through the uh, Google Store, Google Play, or the Apple Store. And you can support the church through that, or you can support it uh, through the address there as well. Once again, thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to open up the Word of God, open up my heart to you, to share some of the ways in which God has been so gracious to me over the years. I know that I have had the opportunity to come face to face with God's messengers. Some of those were flesh and blood some of those, I think, were from the unseen world around us that took form to come bring ministry in some time of great, great distress. But in all things, these things occurred because of the wondrous grace and gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, who rose again, and who will come again for us to take us to glory. God bless you. Have a terrific day as you seek to find him and serve him. Amen.